tonight, so that's good. Um, I must stink or something. We got everybody sitting back a little bit. I mean, that's all right. That's all right. I'll get a shower next week and we'll we'll get it worked out. Um, we got a few in our prayer list we want to keep in our prayers. Uh, we mentioned on Sunday that Miss Brownie would be um, uh, making her way to NHC uh, for rehabilitation, and she is currently in room 206 here at Pulaski NHC. I also want to add to uh, our prayer list as well, uh, Dot Thomas. This is uh, my grandmother, Martha Britton's sister. She is in 206 Meadowbrook also uh, for rehabilitation. I actually had to call my mom because there for a moment I thought that that was going to be the most interesting room at NHC to have Dot, my aunt, and Brownie in the same room would be quite the, quite the pair. But she, one's at Meadowbrook, one's at NHC. Miss Brownie being at NHC, room 206, and Miss Dot uh, Thomas is in uh, room 206 at Meadowbrook. We do also want to keep in our prayers. Uh, we did get word uh, that Mr. Uh, Larry Hutton, this is the brother of Peggy Berry, uh, did pass away. Uh, his services will be this Friday at Bennett May and Pierce Funeral Home with the visitation uh, from 11 uh, to about 1, and the service will follow at 1. So that is uh, keep in our prayers the family of Larry Hutton. This is the brother of Peggy Berry. His services will be Friday, visitation 11 to 1, and service at 1. Yes, sir. Uncle Tom Harville, correct? Harville. All right, so let's keep Tom Harville in our prayers. This is the uncle of Miss Nancy. Also, is not in in great shape, not in good condition at this time. So keep him in our prayers. All right. Uh, if you have any more announcements, especially concerning those who are sick, make sure to fill out the um, Barnabas cards, and we'll pass those to the inside aisles at the appropriate time and get those on our Barnabas list and uh, send up some prayers on their behalf as quickly as possible. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into a study of Joseph. Dear Lord, we're grateful for the day that you have given us. We're grateful for this opportunity that we have to gather here tonight and to enjoy this, this wonderful air-conditioned building that we can sit in great comfort without fear of persecution and ready to study your word and grow and learn from it. Dear Lord, we're, we're grateful especially today for the beautiful rain that you sent us and we're grateful for the gift that it is and we pray for more if it be your will. We're mindful uh, that while we have good health and the ability to be here tonight, that we have several who are undergoing uh, various surgeries or in rehabilitation. Uh, we have those who are experiencing uh, some pain and suffering and sickness and disease at this time. So we want to keep them in our prayers as well as we have those who have lost loved ones. We want to keep the Hutton family in our prayers as they mourn the loss of Mr. Larry. We want to keep Miss Dot Thomas and Brownie Woodard uh, as well at the forefront of our hearts and bring them before you as they continue to recover from procedures as well. We also want to, to remember Mr. Tom Harwell uh, and be with him and comfort him and his family, give him strength and uh, help him uh, during this, this grave uh, time of need within his life. Lord, we're grateful, uh, as we mentioned, for the good health that you've given us, and we hope that we use that good health that we have today to bless others and to help those who maybe are not as, as uh, in good health at the time and help us to do everything that we can to meet the needs of others and to show our love to them in every way that we know how. Lord, we're grateful especially uh, for your son and the sacrifice that he gave, that he came to this earth and lived a perfect life so that we could inherit that eternal home in heaven with you, that we could find ourselves in a position separated from all pain and suffering for eternity, uh, safely located with you in heaven. So we're grateful for all that you do for us. since through your son's most holy name that we do pray. Amen. All right. I did also fail to mention, we want to, of course, continue to remember Mr. Colin Layton, uh, if you can't tell, I'm not Colin Layton. <laughs> I'm filling in again. He's still got some ongoing issues. Um, uh, and so we want to keep him in our prayers uh, that he can get some good test results and that uh, once he receives some of those tests and some of those results that uh, proper care can be taken uh, so that he can uh, get back up here and you don't have to keep putting up with me on Wednesday nights. 
the, study, uh, the story of Joseph, it's a, it's a common uh, story. Um, in fact, I, I had kind of been weary of talking about Joseph at times, and um, I had a, 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 an opportunity, or I have an opportunity to live a, deliver a lesson uh, at, at Fairview's camp this weekend on this topic of Joseph. And so I studied a whole lot more about it, and, and I just, you know, put so much effort into it this week. I was like, well, I'll give it a trial run on Wednesday night since we kind of got a little bit of a, of a strange uh, fill-in rather than uh, a series that we can do uh, here and there. Um, but one of the things I thought about doing was uh, there's a video, and it's called the Attention Test, if you will. And this video has six individuals on the screen, three of which are wearing a white shirt, three of which are wearing a black shirt. And there's two basketballs. And the request is made that you in your, uh, uh, give your attention to those who are wearing the white shirts and count how many times that they are passing the basketball. So they're weaving and bobbing in and out. And I had thought about doing the, the, playing the video, but it's a little bit complex to, to get it working sometimes. Um, and they're bobbing and weaving in and out. They pass the ball about 15 times. Now, at the very end of this segment, where they've passed the ball to and from, a giant question pops up on the center of the screen. And the question is simply, did you see the gorilla? What? You know, did you see the gorilla? And it rewinds the same video. You can restart it from the very beginning if you'd like, or just simply allow for them to rewind. And about midway through the passing of that basketball, a man in a full, fully dressed gorilla suit walks out into the middle, does this, and then turns and walks out the other side. Now, you were watching that video, but why didn't you see the six-foot-tall gorillas <laughs> that walked in and did a little dance and walked out? Well, because your attention was focused on one thing. And oftentimes, if we're not careful, we can do the exact same thing when it comes to our study of the Bible. When we study stories that we have learned from the very beginning of our lives or stories that we have heard from our childhood, oftentimes we dive in and we say, okay, this is what this story means. These three things are what we can take from this story. And, and, and so every time that I read this story, I'm going to reaffirm that this is the message of the story and these are the three things that I can learn from it. Now, the only problem with that is sometimes you miss the proverbial scriptural man in a gorilla suit because you're so focused on one specific thing or this is how the story is that you might miss some additional things. I think that we do that with the, uh, with the story of Joseph. I think that that is something that, that appears within our lives. And So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to start by, by t telling the story of Joseph the way that we have always heard the story of Joseph. And then we're going to learn some other things about the story of Joseph that maybe t have taken a back seat because we have always studied the, the story of Joseph in one way. Uh, let me ask you this. If somebody, any volunteers, brave souls, could summarize in 30 seconds or less the story of Joseph and what we can take from it. Any takers, John? No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't put you on the spot like that. <laughs> I mean, we know the story, Genesis 37, following. We know the story. Any takers? Yeah, give it to us, Mr. Jimmy. <laughs> Absolutely. What does that lesson of Joseph teach us? From what we can see. He's got that moment where he's um, enslaved uh, by being betrayed by his brother, sold into slavery. He goes into Potiphar's house. Potiphar, he, he prospers in Potiphar's house, gets the second command in Potiphar's house. Um, he's uh, betrayed once again in a sense. He's framed, thrown into prison, gains favor in prison, gets out of prison, goes into Pharaoh's uh, 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 kingdom, if you will, or serves Pharaoh in a way, becomes number two in Pharaoh's kingdom, is able to help out the same brothers that betrayed him. And so what do we learn from the story of Joseph based on those things? And he will take care of you. Trust in God, be obedient to him. And he will take care of you. Okay, let's, let's, let's keep that in mind. That's what we have always studied. That's what we've always learned about Joseph. And that is part of the message of what is taught to us about Joseph. 
we are going to look at some, some highlights, if you will, of Joseph's life. If you'll be reminded, if you will, please open to Genesis chapter 37. We're going to spend a little time jumping to and from, summarizing, in a way, the message of uh, the life of Joseph. In Genesis 37, beginning in verse 3, we see that Joseph is, of course, the favorite child of his father. Who is Joseph's father? Starts with a J, ends with an Jacob. Any takers? Jacob, Jacob. He is the son of Jacob. He is the favorite son of Jacob. Why is he the favorite son of Jacob? Because he is the uh, child of... Uh, he, he, is, he is the son of, uh, of Rachel. He is the, uh, the child of, of uh, Jacob's uh, loved, beloved wife, Rachel. And so he places them uh, of much importance. Now, here's where things get a little bit uh, tricky. Uh, not only is he his favorite child, he is very obviously his favorite child. He's given a coat of many colors. Uh, you know, <laughs> the brothers knew it. Uh, Jacob uh, obviously made it known. Joseph even knew it. And because of that, what, we, what do we see in verse 4? Hatred from the brothers towards Joseph. Now, you know what makes a relationship of hatred even better? Walking up and said, I had a dream that every one of you bowed down to me. <laughs> uh, doesn't really make this situation better. In fact, it causes for more hatred on behalf of the brothers towards Joseph. And then included within that, not only does he have an, uh, that dream that causes hatred, he has another dream that causes even more hatred. The Bible, specifically, I believe in verse 11, says, in the New King James Version at least, they, they envied him. But his father, uh, Jacob, remembered these things. Uh, which is a very important lesson, if you will. Notice every time in Scripture, just, I know it's hard for us to remember all these little segments here and there, but notice every time in Scripture that, that a phrase is used, and he remembered these things, or and she remembered these things. You see that uh, here uh, with Jacob remembering um, this with Joseph. You see it with uh, Mary in the discussion with Jesus after he said, I must be about my father's business. She remembered these things within her heart. She placed this within her heart and remembered it. Very good lessons can be learned from that. We'll talk about that uh, some other time, though. So this second dream causes more hatred. So much so that the brothers, verse 18, want to kill Joseph. He's on his way out to, to, to the fields with them. As they see him approach, uh, approaching, they're, they're plotting how to kill Joseph. And uh, in fact, they, they even scream out, here comes this dreamer. Or this dreamer is coming, depending on your translation there in verse 19. In verse 20, they, they seek to kill him and throw him in a pit. But Reuben having compassion as well as a plan uh, here. At least we don't, may, might not know it's a plan uh, as much in that moment. He, he wants to come back. And in fact, we're, we're told that he has this desire to come back. So he, he kind of talks him down from, from murder. So they hate him so much they want to kill him. And so, okay, let's take a step back. Let's, let's at least throw him in this pit. The only problem was is that after they stripped him and threw him in the pit, they sit down for a meal, which I think is a grave... Um, horrific thing that we see you know just think think about it like this when you are filled with guilt what is one of the last things that you want to do eat and what are the brothers doing they're eating their hatred for joseph seems to be so extreme that this is nothing to them gives indication that their hearts are already made up they wanted Joseph dead. They strip him, they throw him in a pit. We get into this next section. They see these, uh, these people on the way uh, passing through, so they sell him into slavery. We get into this next section, and Reuben, like we mentioned, he had compassion, he had a plan. He tries to go back and to save Joseph. The only problem is, is that when he goes back to save Joseph, he has already been sold into slavery. So he tears his clothes and he utters this phrase, where shall I go? Or how shall I return? How am I going to return to my father? Now that his favorite son has died. Uh, so they lie to Jacob. They get, they get back, the brothers lie to Jacob. They dip the coat in, blood, in uh, lamb's blood. Tell, uh, which, uh, coincidental, you think? The type of blood that they dipped his uh, garment in? I don't think so. I don't think it was coincidental at all. I think that was in, in, intentional. Maybe not from them, but I think it's intentional for the, study of the st story of the Bible. Um, they lie to Jacob. This um, uh, leads to a great deal of disarray. In Jacob's uh, heart, uh, they try to comfort him, but no one could comfort him. Joseph is then sold to Potiphar, 
And once he is in Potiphar's house, Potiphar saw that God had made Joseph to prosper in whatever he does. So he places him at the second-hand position or second-in-command of his household. We get into this next section, and we see in verse 7 of Genesis 39, Potiphar's wife seeks to, uh, to lie with, is how the Bible words it, to lie with Joseph. The only problem is, is that Joseph doesn't want to do that because he's a righteous man. He doesn't want to sin against God nor against Potiphar. And this was not enough for Potiphar's wife. She sent, uh, seeked, uh, continued to seek to tempt him, and yet he flees in refusal. In doing so, she frames him because of his leaving of his coat, and she says that he tried to force her. Potiphar is angered, throws Joseph in jail. Once he gets to jail, guess what? Joseph gains favor with the prison keeper, and he also prospered. So much so that he had a position of power, seemingly, within the prison. And while in prison, he encounters two individuals, one of which is the chief butler. And he tells Joseph about his dream. So Joseph then interprets the chief butler's dream in verse 40 and at 12 and 13. I hope you all are writing all this down while I'm getting it. No, no it's okay. Uh, this is because we know the story. We're going to talk about some other stuff here in a minute. The chief butler uh, told that he, uh, was told that he would be restored within three days. And so... Um, it, with that idea, with that concept of restoration, Joseph gives him a simple task. Remember me in your restoration. Remember me when you were placed back into that position of power. You know, uh, when it comes to, some translations call him the chief uh, cupbearer. That's a, that's a great deal of trust to be placed in, 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 that, in the hands of that individual. This is the one who pours the, 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 the drink for the, pharaoh, for the pharaoh. Very trusted man. Um, and he's going to be restored. And he says, remember me when you get back into that position of power. Remember me. The only problem is, is that he does not. However, that's a little on uh, down the road uh, that we'll see that a little bit more. But the chief baker hears this wonderful message that the chief butler, the chief cupbearer gets, that he's going to be restored in three days. So he says, I have also had a dream. And he tells Joseph of this dream. And uh, Joseph then interprets that instead of being restored, that he was going to be killed in three days. Now, the chief butler in three days, uh, it was the Pharaoh's birthday, the chief butler is restored and the chief baker is killed. Very same way um, that, um, that Joseph had said these things were to take place. And so all these things uh, uh, were done just as Joseph had, had said they would be done based on his knowledge, of course, given unto him by the Lord. Now, here's the sad part. You get this restoration of the chief butler. The only problem is, is he did not keep his promise or he did not keep his side of the agreement with Joseph. So when he is restored, he does not remember Joseph until, of course, the Pharaoh also has a dream. This dream, nobody can interpret. It wasn't just that their own um, um, interpretations weren't good enough. Nobody could interpret these dreams. Uh, and so uh, he, he's seeking after, and then this is finally when the chief butler, the chief cupbearer, remembers this Joseph, calls for this Joseph to come. Joseph, um, uh, Joseph then tells Pharaoh what these dreams mean concerning the seven years of famine, uh, excuse me, the seven years of plenty, and then the seven years of famine. And Joseph becomes second in command and is given a wonderful and great deal of trust concerning the things of the Lord. And then, of course, the last little thing that we see is that the famine begins after the seven years of plenty. Okay, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. That's, that's a big old summary. That's a whole lot. Uh, but like I said, we know this story. We've studied this story. Many of us have heard this probably from very early within our lives in, in Bible class or at VBS, this, that, and the other. Heard it in sermons. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to open to Genesis chapter 41 and verse 37. That's what we're going to focus on a lot tonight. Uh, as was pointed out to us concerning the this, this story of Joseph, you've got a lot of up and downs. You've got this, these moments of things are going great for Joseph. Things are going good. Uh, he's the favorite child. He's got a wonderful gift until he is sold into slavery by his brothers after, after having these two dreams. Uh, things are, are horrible uh, until he gains favor with Potiphar, his place second in command. Um, uh, oh, something I missed as well. Uh, I really don't, don't need to miss this. Um, Joseph, being the favorite son of, of, uh, of Jacob, would come with it some benefits, almost making him to be second in command. Now, because of the way that the, the firstborn would work, 
he would not technically be second in command. We'll, but we'll get to that a little bit more in just a little bit. So he, he get, he's gaining favor everywhere that he is. In Potiphar's house, he gains favor, placed in second in command. He's got this issue with Potiphar's wife. He gets framed. He gets thrown in prison, gains favor with the, with the prison guard, um, and then has this moment of, of kind of a slump again. Once the chief butler is restored, he forgets about uh, about Joseph, and so he's staying in prison. And then finally you get this interpretation of the dream of Pharaoh, and now he's his second in command, and he is in this position. Now, because of, this, because of that side of the story of Joseph, oftentimes what we think about that story is always focused upon that same principle, be faithful unto God, and God will bless you, even in times of conflict. And yes, that is a wonderful way to look at that story. And yes, that is a wonderful application of that story. But the story of Joseph does not just simply end there. Now, here's where things get a little, a little tricky as well. When you look throughout the book of Genesis, you see this phrase, the generations of, uh, throughout the book of Genesis. In fact, if you start all the way back in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4, you see the generations of heaven and earth. In, in Genesis 5-1, you see the generations of Adam, the generations of Noah in chapter 6 and verse 9, the generations of the sons of Noah, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, uh, in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 1, specifically the generations of, of, of uh, Shem, which will be important here in just a moment, in Genesis 11 and verse 10, of Terah in 11-27, Ishmael 25-12, uh, Isaac 25-19, two accounts for the generations of Esau, uh, and that is Genesis 36, 1, as well as Genesis 36, 9. And then you get this, this last section, if you will, the last generational divide um, that is mentioned is Jacob in Genesis 37, 2. So when we start out in the book of Genesis, we focus on these genealogies, we see these common themes throughout, we focus on this is the important side of things, and yet, by the time we get to Genesis chapter 37, what do we typically focus on? Do we look at the story of Genesis 37 and following as the story of Jacob? Or, we do, do, or do we look at the story of Genesis 37 and following as the story of Joseph? Oftentimes we look at Joseph because it talks about Joseph a whole lot. However, the focus is upon this lineage, is upon these genealogies, if you will. And this focus points to three themes, excuse me, points to three themes that we see throughout the book of Genesis. Now, these three themes are very simple. If, you, if you're a note taker, these are the three things you need to write down for tonight, okay? Uh, the first promise uh, or theme that we see in Genesis is the land promise. Everybody say it with me. Land promise. All right, that was great. Y'all did great on that repetition side of things. Let's try for the second one. The second one is the seed promise. You want to try it again? The second one. Seed, there we go. All right, and the last one is the covenant promise. Let's say it together. Covenant promise. So land, seed, covenant. These three things are essential pillars to understanding the message of the book of Genesis. And specifically, understanding certain sections of the message of the book of Genesis. You don't believe me? Let's look at some of these stories in the book of Genesis and see these three pillar statements, or see these three pillar themes throughout. For instance, in creation, what do we have in creation? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, which represents what? Land. Included within that land is the creation of plants and mankind, which reproduce after itself. Another way of saying something that reproduces after itself is a seed. It's a continuation, plants. Uh, at least seed-bearing plants, uh, put off seeds uh, and in, in the same way man does as well. And then you've got this covenant relationship with God. Man and God are existing together in a place of no pain or suffering. They're existing in a place where God and man can be together. There's no sin. There is no unrighteousness. It is God and man in the garden together. Everything is perfect. And each of these three things are within creation. However, when we get to the fall of man, Genesis chapter 3, and you see sin enter into this world, we see these three things once again. Why? Because man, after sinning, is kicked out of the land, is then given another covenant, 
And within that covenant is the what covenant? The seed covenant. The seed of the devil or the, the lineage of devil and the seed of, of woman. Or, uh, a, 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 of course, uh, that is pointing towards Christ. These things carry on throughout the book of Genesis. We look at the story of Abraham. Remember good old Abraham? What is Abraham given? He is given a covenant which contains a promise of what? A seed. And that seed is going to inherit a what? Land. See how it's continuing throughout? And then uh, we get to this story, if you will, uh, with a little bit of, of skipping along the way. That's just a few examples of this uh, covenant uh, seed and land or land seed and covenant promises. Then we get to the story of Joseph. Now, these three themes don't just magically disappear with Joseph. They don't just cease to exist once we start studying in Genesis chapter 37. These things will appear and we'll talk about them as they do appear. But let's, let's kind of reverse it a little bit. Let's kind of go back. There are three sets of dreams. Now, these are very important for us to point out as well. There's three sets of dreams. Anybody remember the first set of dreams? When did the first set of dreams appear? All the way back in Genesis 37, the dreams between, uh, of Joseph and his what? And his brothers. Um, uh, as, and then, of course, the second dream would include also um, with um, Jacob... Um, saying, or, or me and your mother to bow to you as well. The second set of dreams, when do they appear? In his time in what? Prison. In his time in prison with the servants that receive those dreams. In the last set of dreams, two dreams, once again, coincidental that there's two dreams, two dreams, and then two dreams? Don't think so. Uh, two dreams once again, and this time, who is dreaming those dreams? Pharaoh. So you've got Joseph uh, with these dreams about his brothers. You've got the two servants with the dreams about themselves. And you've got Pharaoh with the dreams concerning the famine. Now here's where things get a little bit tricky. Here's where things get a little bit um, sad in a way. And this is where I want us to get into Genesis chapter 41. Uh, I mentioned for you to turn there. I promise I wasn't going to leave you there all night and just not pick up there. Genesis chapter 41. We're going to pick up in verse 37. Um, the, the, the only issue uh, that we have with the story of Joseph being a positive, an overall positive thing that happens to Joseph. I mean, when you think about it, uh, when, when you think about Egypt within itself, Egypt up until that point was the most prosperous nation known to man up to that point, at least that we have history of. The most prosperous nation. And he is number two. In the whole nation. Potiphar had a prosperous home. How do we know that? Well, because everything that, that Joseph did prospered. He was number two in charge. So you, you think about, okay, if you, were, if you were the number two, you're the vice president of the most prosperous nation in the world. Wouldn't you see that as a good thing? Wouldn't you think that that is a very positive thing? Most of us probably would. And the problem is, is, Joseph didn't seem to think so at times. Look at Joseph's words and the des description given of Joseph here in Genesis chapter 41 beginning in, uh, in verse 37. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Is Pharaoh speaking very highly of him in this moment? Absolutely. Can we find anyone who has the Spirit of God in him? Can we find anyone who has such a, 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 a wonderful spirit within him? This advice is good in the eyes of Pharaoh. It is good in the eyes of the servants. The only problem is uh, his brothers didn't believe him. You look back at Genesis chapter 37, verses 5 to 11. This is a messenger from, of God. Joseph is having these dreams not just as a way of, you know, hey, I, I slept last night and I had a dream. He's having these dreams as a message from God. And yet, what do the brothers not do? They don't listen. They don't find them to be true. In fact, they are filled with hatred. And, and yet, who does listen? Well, from what we see in Genesis chapter uh, 41, verses 37 through 38, it is not the godly descendants of Jacob who listen, who would eventually have... Tribes, the tribes of Israel named after them. 
It is this pagan following Pharaoh who sees this messenger of God as a true messenger of God. So you've got a wonderful message, but the wrong people are benefiting from these messages. Everything is all wrong because we see that everyone, every house, excuse me, that Joseph serves prospers. We see this in chapter 39 and verse 3 uh, with Potiphar's house. We see this again um, in, in prison. And of course, we see this again with the Pharaoh. The only problem is this is the wrong house that is prospering. Where should Joseph be at this moment? He should not be in Pharaoh's house. Where, whose house should he be in? His father's. But he's not there. Why? Because of the hatred of his brothers. So he's, he's at the wrong place, and therefore the wrong house is prospering. Notice the description given in chapter 41, verses 39 and 40. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning or as wise as you. You shall be over all my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. He is prospering, but he's in the wrong house prospering. He should be at home. Because of the so um, that's where things get a little bit tricky as well. That word God there. Um, let me double check myself and make sure I don't mislead you here. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that that word God is not necessarily, and like I said, I could be wrong, but I'm gonna double check. That word God there is not necessarily speaking about the one true God of Israel. Um, remember, this is a pagan Pharaoh. Uh, he he doesn't. I necessarily believe in the God of all creation. Uh, Let me double check that though. Uh, So it is Elohim here. So it's the the plural, the gods uh, in the ordinary sense. uh, Sometimes is specifically used to refer to as the supreme God. So this could be that he is specifically talking about God. But it's also very likely, especially from a pagan, uh, to be talking about the gods. And little g gods within his mind. Especially in a place like Egypt. Um, so it, it could be that it's specifically one, and could be that it's another. And something else to add to that as well, if you're an Egyptian, you don't really have an option. <laughs> if, if the Pharaoh says that we serve this God, guess who you serve? You serve that God. Uh, it, it, you, know, you can look at other places in Scripture, uh, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, which we'll talk about in just a second as well. So he's in the wrong house. So the wrong house is prospering. Let's keep looking at verse 41, and we'll see that he should be at home with his father, but instead... He is in Egypt. Notice in in brackets here, I put, or parentheses here, I put the opposite of Canaan. When you look at the story of of Israel, you look at the story of God's deliverance out of the hands of of evil and uh, wrongdoing, where is God delivering the people of Israel from? Egypt. Taking them out of this land of sorrow and delivering to this, this promised land of peace and comfort. This land that they are promised to be flowing with with milk and honey. So you've got this almost opposite of Canaan, if you will. And that's where Joseph is. In fact, that's a lot of the reason why we find the Egyptian, uh, the um, Israelites later in, uh, in Egypt. Because you've got this wonderful relationship between Pharaoh and Joseph. This new Pharaoh comes along. Joseph is dead. The old Pharaoh is dead. And this new Pharaoh does not know Joseph. And so he's very harsh to the people of Israel. Um, but once again, that's a whole other story. So you've got this almost opposite of Canaan. And this is, this, is where, this is where Joseph is. He's in Egypt, a pagan land serving under a pagan king who worships, not Joseph, but the pagan king, who worships pagan gods. Um, and so he's not supposed to be there. He's supposed to be at home. And notice, if you will, this is where things get a little bit interesting. Uh, well, in verse 41 of chapter 41, it reads, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See that I set you over all the land of Egypt. He's in the land of Egypt. Then verse 42 gets interesting, because guess what he is given? Notice in verse 42, Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off of his hand and put it on, Jacob's, uh, excuse me, on Joseph's hand and then clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Guess what Joseph gets? A coat. <laughs> he's given a robe. The only problem is he's already got one. He's got one that belongs to him, that was stolen from him, that was used in a way to trick his father into thinking that he was dead, that he was murdered by an animal. So he's already got a robe. He doesn't need this robe. He should be at home in his father's house, making his father's house to prosper. He should be at home wearing this, this cloak, this robe that had been given unto him by his father, but yet he's in Egypt 
under the rule of a pagan god. Uh, excuse me, under the rule of a pagan leader who follows after pagan gods. Notice what happens next in verse 3. Excuse me, verse 43. And he had him ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried out before him. Notice this. Bow the knee. And, uh, and so set him over all the land of Egypt. Is that the first time that appears in this story? Bowing to Joseph? No. Where did it appear the first time? In the dream. Where his brothers were bowing down to him. So look at this next section here. Uh, he is given a wife. Uh, I'm not going to even attempt to properly uh, pronounce her name. But from the best I think I can see, it's as an ath. <laughs> and so if I say it with confidence, maybe that's what we'll roll with. Verse 41 and, and, uh, and 45. The only problem is... Is this, this Azanath, as we see in the next few verses, or even at the end of that verse, uh, verse, is that she is the pagan daughter of a pagan priest. Now remember, he's a part of the covenant. He's a part of the seed, the land, the, the, the covenant promises that had been made. This is Joseph that we're talking about. And now he is in a foreign land under a foreign king with a, a foreign um, um, cloak, uh, being bowed down to by foreign people, marrying now a foreign woman. He should be at home with his people, making them to prosper in his jacket, with his brothers to bow down, and he should be not marrying this pagan uh, daughter of a pagan priest. A couple more, and then we'll, t- and then we'll, we'll talk about it all together. Um, and then he's given some, uh, some sons. Now here's where things get really, really, really interesting. You don't believe me that this whole situation is all wrong. You don't see all these things. Oh, that he's not where he should be. He shouldn't be here. This is where things get really, really interesting. Because if you remember, he has two sons born to him. Now, he's in Egypt marrying an Egyptian woman. And he is second in command in Egypt. And when his two boys are born, he does not give them names. Um, he does not give them names that... Um, Did I skip one? I feel like I skipped one. Oh, I didn't put it in the PowerPoint. There you go. I missed it. I was about to say, I know I missed something here in verse uh, verse 45. Go back with me to verse 45. It says, Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paneah, and he gave him the wife Azanath, uh, the daughter of uh, Potipharah, a priest of On. So Joseph went on uh, out over all the land of Egypt. He's given a new name. Now, when we think about being given a new name, my mind immediately at least goes to the three that I mentioned previously. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now when they're given Babylonian names, do we think of that as a positive thing or as a negative thing? Typically a negative thing. They've got names. They're in bondage in Babylon. We don't want to be in bondage in Babylon. We don't want Babylonian names. We have Hebrew names. So you think Joseph wants an, Egypt, an Egyptian name? Zaphnath Paneah, I believe. Yeah, Zaphnath Paneah. Very fun name, uh, but it's not his name. He's got a name. It's Joseph, a Hebrew name. And so by the time that he has his children to be born, he names both of his sons Hebrew names. Now, here's where things get real fun. You, you don't think that Joseph uh, it, it doesn't like where he's at. Notice the names of the two boys. The first being what? Manasseh. And the second being what? Ephraim. What does Manasseh mean? For God has made me forget all of my toil and all my father's house. Now this does not mean that he forgot who his father was. He means he has forgotten what his brothers have done, for, d- done towards him. Not that he doesn't remember it. Like it's not in his mind. Like he doesn't just think about, hey, you remember that time that my brother sold me into slavery? He's not harboring these emotions. And remember, he's second in command in Egypt. He is, he is the guy second only to the Pharaoh. And what does he name his second son? Ephraim. What does Ephraim mean? For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now, when we think about the land of my affliction, do we typically think about Egypt? Especially when we think about the guy who's second in command in Egypt. Maybe we think about Egypt as the land of affliction when you think about the, the Israelites that are on down the road when they're in bondage. But right now, as second in command in Egypt... For him to say, in the land of my affliction, is a little bit weird. But you're, you're, you're number two. You're prosperous. 
And yet you call yourself, uh, or yet you name your son, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. That land of my affliction phrase is very, very important for us to, to focus on and, and to set our hearts upon. Uh, the land of the affliction that he mentions here, specifically talking about Egypt. Joseph, Joseph seemingly doesn't want to be, he wants to be back in his father's house. He longs to be with his father's house. As we continue the story uh, of Joseph, you'll see that that is the very thing that, that Joseph uh, yearns for. There is no way that it is already that time. Okay, that's the very thing that Joseph yearns for. He wants to be back at home. And so he mentions this land of affliction. There's a few things that he, uh, that he points out there. He's not focusing um, to be identified with his past pain. He's put those things behind him. That's why he named Manasseh Manasseh. But he is rather focusing on the precious promises that are given unto him. Joseph is in this land of the affliction, but he is choosing to focus on the covenant that God has made with him. We should do the very same thing. In fact, Paul does the same thing. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is the land of the affliction. Pain, suffering, death, sickness, disease, all these things are here. Sin, all these things are here. He's longing to be with the Lord, but he understands he has work to do here. That's what Joseph does. He's in Egypt. This is his land of the affliction, but he's wanting to continue the work. We even sing songs, this world is not my home, as a reminder of what? This is not the end. This is not where we belong. This is our land of affliction. We experience pain, suffering, sin, this, that, and the other. But we, be long, for, uh, we long for something that is, is far more important. Let's look at Genesis chapter 45, verses 2 through 8. I want us to notice something. The reason why we see the story of Joseph... The reason why it's important for us to study is not just so that we can be reminded of this wonderful message of God's deliverance. Notice the, the, the purpose behind this. Genesis 45, verses 5 through 8. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, talking to his brothers. For God sent me before you, not necessarily standing before you. God sent me to Egypt before you to do what? Preserve life. Notice, for these two years, the, the famine have been in the land. There's still five years to go in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you, notice this once again, to preserve a posterity for you in the earth. Save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, the Lord of all his house, and the ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Why was Joseph in Egypt? Was it so that he could prosper and teach us a lesson about we can prosper if we're faithful? No. He was in Egypt because he was sent to preserve that seed. Is Joseph the continuation of the seed promise from Jacob? Is he the descendant that is included within the genealogies of Jesus? No. Who is? Who is the seed line to follow? Is it Joseph? No. Who is it? Judah. Judah, which would eventually bring Christ. Judah is this seed line. So why is Joseph in Egypt in the first place? It's not just because his brother sold him into slavery. He is in Egypt to preserve the seed line, to keep Judah alive. Now, you ready for this? There's a whole lot that we could talk about with that. All right, there's a whole lot that we could talk about with that. Notice, but it is not... Uh, it is not Joseph, that is the seed line, continues as Judah. Cain uh, kills Abel, bringing forth Seth. Seth's lineage brings us Noah. From Noah we get Shem, go on uh, several generations, I believe nine. You get Abram, from Abram, not Ishmael, not the, not the son of Hagar, uh, but Isaac. Uh, and then from Isaac, who do we get? Uh, you get Esau, Jacob eventually. And then eventually uh, from Jacob you get the 12 sons, including Judah, who is the seed line, not Joseph. From Judah, who you get several generations down, David. And from David, who do you get? Jesus, the true seed. Why is Joseph in this story? Not because he is the seed. He is here to preserve the seed, Judah. He's here to keep Judah alive. So why Joseph? Joseph didn't go into Egypt so that we could say, stay faithful in tough times and God will bless you and make you to be prosperous. That's, that's not really the message of the Bible that we see often, is it? We're told often, in fact, that we will not be prosperous on this earth, that we will have suffering. Why was he sent there? He was put in Egypt so that Judah, the promised seed, wouldn't starve. You know, the same Judah, the one who wanted to take the place of Benjamin after Benjamin was framed by Joseph, which is coincidental. 
Benjamin being the, now the new favorite, if you will. Uh, Judah finally stands up as he should for his brother, Benjamin. Benjamin is going to be thrown in prison. What does Judah say? Take my place. I can't go home and not have Benjamin. Let me, uh, allow for me to take his place. Uh, and, and that happens. Why? So that David, from Judah, the promised seed would be born and once again save his people in the fight with Goliath. So that, what, so that who could be born? So that Jesus, the promised seed, would be born and save his people. Why was it that Joseph was sent to this earth and lived all, through all that turmoil? It's not just so that we could see that God's people prosper from time to time. It's so that he could preserve the seed line of Judah. And the ultimate result would then be, be to bring uh, Christ into this world to save us from all of our people, uh, from all of our sins, excuse me, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a whole lot we could talk about with this. But when we look at the stories of the Bible, with the same way that we look at that attention-grabbing message, we miss the gorilla. And here's the gorilla of the story of Joseph. Yes, God's people prosper at times, even when in tough circumstances. But ultimately, the story of Joseph does not just teach us that lesson. It also teaches us that ultimately God's seed is preserved so that God's will is done, so that man is saved, so that we can be in heaven with God for eternity. God is always victorious. And, we, and he was put there, Joseph was put there to preserve that seed promise. I wish I had six more hours for us to study Joseph because there's so much that we could talk about. We could dive in all these verses, but we don't. I thank you for letting me go over. Um, we probably will not pick up here. We'll probably pick up with something totally different. If you have questions, please feel free uh, to reach out to me throughout the week. Uh, and we can talk about this stuff a little bit more. Thank you so much for your time.